The first game you're going to create is called Ball Game 1. Other teachers may start a game design course by showing you how Scratch works and teaching you a bunch of tools and commands, then finally allow you to design a game. No way! Our goal is for each of you to create three games by the end of the first day. To make it interesting, let's see if you can make two different games before lunch. Start by opening Scratch and figuring out how to make the cat move across the screen. This is where you'll guide students through the first few challenges on the projector. Starting with the projector gets everybody on the same page and gives a soft introduction to Scratch skills. Please avoid describing the interface and demonstrating solutions. Permit more advanced Scratch users to race ahead and create their own challenges for each other. So, if the first challenge is to move the cat, some students will realize they can do that by just clicking and dragging the cat. Not so exciting though. How could we do that with blocks? Well, by default, when you open Scratch, usually the motion category here is selected, which presents all the blocks that can be used to create movement for that cat sprite. So please ask your students to move the cat with blocks. They can figure it out. If any of them are having trouble, you could just instruct them individually to click on any of the move blocks to make that cat move. Move 10 steps means the cat spread is moving 10 steps across. Turn 15 degrees, turning 15 degrees. Or go to will go to a specific XY location. And so on. Please don't worry about understanding every single block. Scratch at this point should be about discovery, the first step in the game design process, exploring the interface and just trying things out. So moving cat with blocks could be as simple as clicking once on a block, or combining blocks, such as the move and the turn, and you can click on those combined blocks. Click multiple times, click, 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 to combine actions. Now, what if you want the cat to keep moving? I say, let's move on to challenge number two. Move the cat with keyboard arrow keys. Not by clicking on blocks, but by allowing a player to use, press the up arrow, left arrow, down arrow. So if you go into the events category, do you see the block there that has to do with keyboard movement? See what I just did there? I didn't tell you what to do. I asked you a question and gave you an opportunity to discover it. That's what we're looking for in this activity. So let's assume you've discovered the when space key pressed. See that triangle? That's right, it means contextual menu. Look at all the different keys that you can use in Scratch to control your projects. We're going to start with just the up arrow key. So when up arrow key pressed, let's move 10 steps. But if we want to move up the stage here, I'll also need to point in the direction up before I move. Up. See, another contextual menu. Now when I press the up arrow key on my keyboard, what does the cat do? Points in the direction up and moves 10 steps. Not very surprising. How about the down arrow? When down arrow key pressed, again, I will point in direction, except now we want to point down and move 10 steps. Click the down arrow key, there's my cat, moving down 10 steps. You don't have to keep dragging blocks, you can also duplicate blocks. If you hold the shift key on your keyboard and click on one of those hat-shaped blocks at the top, you can choose duplicate. If I've duplicated, then I can just change to right arrow, point in direction right, move 10 steps. Let's test it, right arrow, moving 10 steps. Duplicate one more time for left arrow, and move left by pointing in direction left. left. But look what happened to the cat. It flipped upside down on its head. I didn't mind when it was going in those other directions, but it's a little weird going on its head. So do you see another block in this category that would have to do with how a sprite rotates? 
I did it again. I didn't tell you which block to get. I'm asking you to find that block on your own. There are actually a few different blocks that have to do with rotation. The block near the bottom, set rotation style to left right, will do what I want here. Watch, now when I press the left arrow key, it just points left. If I go up and down, it's staying in the last direction that it was pointing. Pretty cool. Left, right. If you still want the cat to be pointing in a different direction when it's going up and down, you could set rotation style for up and down back to all around. Down, down, all around. So now up, down, right, left. Just what I like think might be ready for another challenge. So what about challenge three? You'll see each of these challenges in your teacher guide, so don't worry about remembering each one. Challenge three is to add a soccer ball to the scene. So right now we have a cat that we can move with our arrow keys. How do we add a new sprite? See where our first sprite is. Do you see something in that area? Some buttons maybe that will let you add sprites? If you're not sure what the buttons are, watch. If I move my cursor onto a button, it will give me a description. And look what the first one is. Choose Sprite from Library. I'm going to click on that. There are a lot of sprites to scroll through. So the Scratch development team did something just for us teachers that's very handy to remember. Look at the categories on the left. These act as filters, filtering out all the things we don't need to see. So for instance, if I'm looking for transportation, click on transportation. Now I only need to go through a much more manageable number of sprites. But I don't want transportation, I want a soccer ball. So I'm going to go to things and scroll down until I see that soccer ball. There we go. Click OK. Now I have a soccer ball. I've added a soccer ball to the scene. I've completed challenge number three. So how about challenge number four? Program the ball to bounce around the screen. Well, you've already discovered the blocks for moving things on the stage in that motion category. So you could use a move 10 steps block, but I don't want you to be clicking the ball repeatedly. That doesn't feel like a game. So see if you can find a block that repeats movement over and over and over again. We call those blocks loops. Loops are a very important concept in programming. Very important to remember. Being able to repeat things over and over again. If you look in the control category, do you see the loops? The loops are formed like mouths. That means I could take a loop like repeat 10, and it will wrap around that move 10 steps. Now if I click, it'll move 10 times 10 steps. But when it gets to the edge, see what happens? It goes off the stage and stops moving. Under motion, do you see a block that has to do with sprites getting to the edge of the stage? I do. If on edge, bounce. If I put that in there and click that repeat block again. But you know, repeat's only moving a little bit. Could we use a different loop? I'm going to click and drag the repeat block back into the drawer to delete it. Go back to control and take a forever block. Now if I click, it should forever bounce back and forth. Back and forth. But if it's just pointing left, right, that's not very exciting. I want to make it bounce around the stage more like in a Pong game. So what I'm going to do at the beginning is say point in direction, but not 90 degrees. In addition to the four directions that are there, I can just click on the 90 and set any value I want by typing. So at the beginning, I want to set my ball to 30 degrees. Now to start my game, I want to click the green flag. So if you look in the events category, see that block when green flag clicked? When green, when green flag clicked, point in direction and then keep moving. So watch, I'll click the green flag and now I have a ball that starts at 30 degrees and then bounces around the stage. Completing challenge number four. 
The final challenge for ball game one is to program the cat to kick the ball. This is an open-ended challenge. The student can decide what it means to have the cat kick the ball. A simple version of this would be just to have the ball bounce off the cat. Right now, the ball bounces off the edges of the stage, but passes right through the cat. So how do we make the ball detect when it's touching the cat and have it change its direction? This requires some programmatic thinking. Another word that we'll use for programmatic is algorithmic. Algorithmic is a really big word that just means breaking things down into individual steps. So when the ball touches the cat, I'm going to click stop. I'm going to manually do this. I'm going to click and drag the ball. The ball has bounced, bounced, bounced. It's heading towards the cat. Now the first thing we need the program to do is detect when the ball is touching the cat. So let's go into our sensing category. These are all the different things that Scratch can detect. Look at the very first one, touching, with a contextual menu. If I click it, one of the things it can check is if it's touching Sprite 1, which is my cat. So I'm going to drag touching Sprite 1 into my scripts area. But there's a problem. Look, the shape is not the same as these other shapes. There's no nice Lego socket for snapping it into other blocks. So obviously this block needs another block to fit into my script. This collection of blocks that are snapped together is referred to as a script. A bunch of commands linked together so that when you run your program, they'll run in sequence. Look in the control category. Do you see any blocks that have a shape similar to the shape of my touching block? See those sockets? In wait and repeat, we have white sockets with numbers in them. But look at those if-then blocks. Wait and repeat until. See, they have a socket shaped just like my touching sprite. So what if we take if-then, drag it into my scripts area, and then put the touching sprite 1 into the if-then. If touching sprite 1, then do something. If-then is a very powerful block. It's also a core concept for programming in virtually any programming language. It, you want to check a condition, and if the condition is true, execute another command, or a whole sequence of commands. In this case, what do we want to do when the ball touches the cat? The ball's moving 10 steps forward, it touches the cat, and we want it to turn and go in a different direction. So I'll go back into motion, and what if I say turn, how many degrees? 180. But that's not the only right answer. So if you're doing this with students, you could invite them to try different values there. I like 180 or 90. It makes it feel more like that Pong game that I grew up with. But this block right now is never going to execute. Why? Because it's standing alone. It's not part of this when green flag clipped. So what I could do is drag it up here so that it's part of my script. But if I click run, I'm going to have a problem. Watch, I'm going to move my ball to here, click run by clicking the green flag, and it just goes right through the cat. Why isn't it turning 180 degrees when it's touching the sprite? Can you see why? That if-then statement is only running once at the very beginning. I click the green flag, my ball points in direction 30, and then it checks if it's touching sprite. If not, it goes to the forever loop, and then it stays in that forever loop forever. It never checks that if again. So watch, I'm going to pull the forever loop off, click and drag the if into that forever loop so that it will keep checking if it's touching while my program is running. Click the green flag, and look, it works, kind of. It's a little bit stuck on my cat, but if I move my cat, it does bounce off my cat. I kind of liked it being stuck though, it made it look like dribbling, so maybe you could challenge students that find this 
to work dribbling into their game. They can dribble that soccer ball, and then when they're ready, use another keyboard key, maybe the space bar, to kick it forward. But I would say this is an acceptable solution to kicking the ball. Some students will go for a more advanced solution. Maybe they want their ball to go in, a, in the actual direction that the cat is moving. So in that case, they could take the cat's direction. Look, we have direction right here. If I click that block, it tells me the direction the cat is pointing in. If I move the cat up and click the block again, now the direction is zero. See, because zero in the scratch world means up. But this direction, all it does is reports the direction the cat's going in. That doesn't help me so much. If I go in the soccer ball and click on direction, it's telling me the direction not of the cat, but of the soccer ball. So I need a way for the cat's direction to be reported to the soccer ball, so that when the cat touches the soccer ball, the soccer ball moves in the direction the cat is pointing, right? I hope I'm not losing you. If this is too confusing, don't worry. This is a little bit more advanced. I just wanted to show you in case some of your students are racing ahead. So how do I get the soccer ball to recognize what direction the cat is pointing in? I need a variable. Variables, just like in algebra, hold a value. And that value can be used by different sprites. So watch. In the data category, see that button, make a variable? If I make a variable, and I call it cat direction, I want to make sure it's for all sprites. So the cat can set that variable, and the ball can recognize that variable. I'll click OK. Now I have some new blocks. One of them is set cat direction. Now, I'm going to pull in a when green flag clicked. I want to set cat direction to be what? The direction the cat is pointing. But if I only set it at the beginning and then I move my cat, the ball's not going to recognize a new direction. It's only setting it once. So what block do I need to keep setting the direction? Well, the same block that you used for if-then, we want to use now. Control, forever, when green flag clicked, set cat direction. Keep setting the variable cat direction to the direction of this sprite, right? Then on the ball, I'm going to say, that I want to take that cat direction, and point in the direction the cat is pointing. But not at the beginning. I want to do it when touching sprite 1. So what I could do, instead of turn 180 degrees, let's get rid of that turn, go back to motion, and say point in direction, cat direction. Now, if I click, the ball is going to move in whatever direction the cat is moving in. If I'm moving up, oops, if I'm moving up, it'll move up down, it'll move down. Pretty cool, right? Now what would be the third, more advanced way to interpret kicking? Not only having the ball go in a certain direction, but controlling the kicking with a different keyboard key. Remember I mentioned you could use the space bar to control the direction that the ball goes? So what if we say here, sprite 1. Let's add another when. When space key pressed, I want the cat to kick. How will I do that? Look at the costumes of the cat. By default, the cat has two costumes. One, two. One, two. What does it look like when you do them in sequence? Kicking. See? Kicking. So maybe what I want is to have my cat look like this, costume 2 at the beginning, and then when they press the space bar, it kicks, and then goes back. How would I do that? Well, when any of these arrow keys are pressed, I can go to the looks category and switch costume to costume 2. I don't want to put it in all four, 
So why don't I just put it here in forever? Switch costume to costume 2. So when green flag is clicked, it'll always look like this. Right? So how do I change the costume when I press the space key? Another switch costume block. When space key pressed, switch costume to costume 1. So I space key, I get a kick. But see how quick it is? Quick, 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 quick. The reason it's so quick is it's forever switching back to costume 2. It's switching back so quickly we barely see it. So what if I put a little wait one second in there? Space, space, cool. I don't think we need it one second. We can put decimals, let's say a half second. That way it's still checking the, uh, setting that cat direction for us. Now I can move around, kick, kick. But what I don't like is that it's still it's bouncing off the cat before I kick. Not in the real world, it wouldn't bounce off you until you connect with your foot, right? So maybe what we could do is have the ball bounce off you, but if you're pressing the space key, it will go in the direction that you're facing. I'll show you. So we don't want it to point in the cat direction unless you also have the space key pressed. Not just touching sprite 1, but also if touching sprite 1 and space key is pressed. See, we also have the key space pressed detector block. And in operators, look, we can use and. And is what we call a boolean. It means it checks if something is true or false. So if touching sprite 1 and touching and the, key, the space key is pressed, then you get a true value. If those two things are true, point in direction cat. Now I'm going to click the green flag, move my cat, and look, nothing happens when it's touching the ball. But if I'm touching and I kick, then it moves in that direction. It actually did a headbutt too, which is kind of fun. So you can headbutt or kick. Again, this is the most advanced version that I'm presenting. So three different solutions to that final challenge. I guarantee there are students that are going to come up with other solutions that I haven't even thought of yet. That's great. That's why I really like these open-ended challenges and why I don't want you explaining too much about the challenges. Give the challenge and let the students interpret it for themselves. If there's a student that's frustrated, you can work with them individually and give them more instruction to push through that frustration. So here we have it, our first mini game, ball game one. So in the teacher guide, once they've finished that first challenge, I say that's a really good time for a break. And what you'll want them to do before they go on break, I'm using the offline version of Scratch. So I'm going to do save. I'm going to go to the folder where I have all of my Scratch projects for i2. I'm going to call this Ball Game 1. Now I already have a Ball Game 1, so I have to overwrite that one. If they're online, the Scratch project is going to be automatically saved, but you should instruct them to change the title because by default it will be untitled. So they can click and select the title in the online version, change the title to Ball Game 1. You want all of them to call this first game Ball Game 1. Got it? Cool. Now you're just about ready for your second mini game, but I think you've earned a break too. So take a break, and when you're ready, come back and check out the next video.